ado, I will pass over to uh, Elizabeth to begin. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hello, thank you. Thanks very much um, for inviting me along. It's been a fantastic event and quite a new experience for me. So I hope it all technically goes, goes correct. I'm going to share my, I have a few slides to share with you. And let me just get that set up. There. I think that should be okay now. Um, so I'll just introduce myself as um, the Existing Homes Alliance, for those who are not familiar with it, is a coalition of organizations that came together who wanted to um, argue for improving the existing home, home housing stock to tackle both climate change and fuel poverty. And my colleagues here on the, the panel, um, both Fabrice and Fraser, their organizations are members, um, as well as several other housing and anti-poverty groups and environmental groups. Uh, we, we got together because, as we know, you, you, many of you have heard the figure that 80% you know, of our homes that we have today will also be our homes in, we said 2050, but certainly that applies to 2045 as well. So, you know, so basically, you know, we just have to get on and make them warm, low carbon and affordable to heat now so that we can, you know, lock in those benefits as soon as possible. So how are we doing? We've got, as Caroline said, we're, we're not doing as well as we should, given it's such an obvious um, sector to, to make progress and, and one of the least cost ways, most affordable ways to do so. So we have, we have targets that we're supposed to be meeting and in the residential sector, you can see on this graph that we are, we are making some progress, but certainly not enough to meet the targets we have to be at for 2045. And, and buildings are absolutely a critical sector. It's not one that we can ignore. Um, and it's also an area where we can make early progress over the next decade, which of course is, is critical to reaching, um, avoiding the worst impacts of climate change. Heating of our buildings accounts for almost half of all Scotland's climate change emissions. So you can see how it's such a big, big part of the issue. And as I said, we're as a coalition, we're together on climate change, but we're also very concerned about the impacts of, of fuel poverty. And again, we do have a target. We have a new target for um, bringing fuel poverty down to 5% by 2040. That isn't as, as much as, as we have wanted. Uh, we wanted, of course, for it to be eradicated and sooner. But basically, you know, that should be our society's goal is that fuel poverty should should just be a thing of the past. It shouldn't be something that is blotting um, Scotland society and focus on improving people's lives. And of course, that's even more serious now, given the impacts of COVID-19. And I'm sure Fraser it will talk more about that. This is just a picture of a fuel poverty map of the past, which is, which is bad enough. And it shows, shows the real, um, how it's spread across the entire country. Um, we now have about 25% of households living in fuel poverty. So what we need is, you know, in tackling climate change, it's a big transition, but as we all know, it needs to be a just transition. And that's particularly the case with, with housing. Um, and no household should be left, left behind and all should be able to benefit from warm and healthy homes. And I think we've learned from what's happened with, well, I hope we have from COVID-19 that uh, we need to plan for that transition. You know, the people hurtling into the uh, economic chaos that's happened just now has, has shows, shown us the importance of planning for, to deal with the crisis. So energy efficiency and um, tackling, making buildings more efficient and uh, warmer and drier have been called by the Just Transition Commission in its interim, interim report, a good example of just transition in action. And, that, and they called for expansion, immediate expansion of the current programs. 
And that's because, you know, and, and it's perfect for the green recovery as well. It's shovel ready, I love that term. Uh, it provides immediate and lasting jobs benefits. We, um, it locks in emission reductions now for the future. It helps those most in need, improves our health and well-being, addresses public health um, concerns like such as you know respiratory illness is more people are more at risk if they're in a cold and damp home um, and this is even a greater need with more people working at home and and homeschooling and in terms of the jobs figures it's estimated that you could have in 6,000 jobs you're created with 9,000 at the peak of activity with a big retrofit program and those would be jobs benefits all over the country so it's a no-brainer, really, we know that. Um, and we just have to crack on and do it. How do we get there? The UK Committee on Climate Change has given us this sort of building block diagram um, that shows how we can tackle buildings in terms of new buildings, existing buildings that are off the gas grid and also those that are on the gas grid. And you'll see this column on the left, the gray column, it's energy efficiency improvements in existing buildings it has to apply across the board. So there's, there's an estimate, if we don't do this investment in energy efficiency, it drives up the cost of the transition to low carbon heat for everybody, for all of us as homeowners, for tenants, for landlords, and in terms of the amount of public subsidy needed. It's estimated for, for the UK as a whole, it could cost up to 6.2 billion more up to 2050. So these are costs that we can avoid. So we're lucky in Scotland that we do have an energy efficient Scotland program. We do have um, programs that cover energy efficiency and heat. It covers domestic and non-domestic. It's a multi-year program, but not yet um, with a commitment for multi-year funding going forward. We have, um, this is a slide from the Home Energy Scotland program that provides advice and support. They have area-based programs where street by street people are getting solid wall insulation and the fuel poverty program where people get, um, those who are fuel poor can get grants for bringing their homes up to a higher standard. So, you know, we do have a track record. We're going in the right direction. You know, we know these are, these are tried and tested solutions, so we know what to do. So what's the problem? Uh, it's, it's just not enough. You know, it's, it's thousands, small thousands of homes that are being upgraded each year through these programs. And we need to double what those programs are doing immediately. Um, and we also need to get the, the, the rest, not just the few poor homes, but what they call self-funding or those who are more able to pay engaged as well. So we've called for a big and immediate expansion and acceleration of this program with the overall target for the vast majority homes to be EPC, the Energy Performance Certificate Band C, which is a good standard um, by 2030. And we should be aiming for net zero by 2045. And how we do that, we've got five points. One, as I said, we double the size of the fuel poverty program and that's the area-based schemes I referred to, as well as the national program. So treating up to 30,000 homes a year instead of 15,000. And they should be including renewable heat for now. And those would be supported by grants for the fuel poor. And second, we need a major engagement and advice program with loans and incentives for everyone else to encourage action. Third, we need to set mandatory energy performance standards and encourage voluntary compliance in advance. We should be moving from where we are now at about 40,000 homes a year upgrading to at least 80,000. We have about a million homes that are below that good standard and it's just not good enough. We should be phasing out oil, coal and LPG boilers from 2025. These are low regrets, these are easy um, things that we know need to happen now. And we should be doubling the heat pumps that are going in, renewable heat at a domestic level, doubling it year on year. And I'm sure Fabrice is going to go into that in a lot more detail. So there could never be a better time to do this, except maybe five years ago. But 
you know, people are spending more time at home, they're more at risk from fuel poverty, and we have a huge need for a solid job creation program. So let's just crack on with it and double that ambition and investment in energy efficiency. So I'll pass over now to Fabrice, who will talk about the heat transition. Thanks, Elizabeth, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Fabrice Levesque. I work at WMF Scotland, and my focus is on uh, reducing emissions from the, the problematic areas of our energy system, so buildings being a, the main focus, uh, but also the transport sector. And I agree with everything that Elizabeth just said. Um, can't really emphasise enough how much easier this all becomes um, if we do energy efficiency, and obviously all the extra benefits that come from that as well. So I'm going to talk a bit more about how we eliminate the, the fossil fuel part of, of this equation. Um, and I guess to put things in context, we've made very, very little progress at all. So today, about 6% of Scotland's heat comes from renewable sources. Uh, the vast majority is, is natural gas. So 80% of buildings uh, use that. And then the remainder use a, a mix of coal, oil and LPG. So that 6% has taken about a decade to get to. Um, we probably need to re reach something like 50% renewable energy in heat by 2030. So a huge challenge for us over this next decade. And um, to get to grips with this, to get on track to our climate targets, we really need to have a, an ambitious um, programme of the scale we saw perhaps in, in the 60s and 70s when the, the old town's gas system was um, converted to, to natural gas from the North Sea. So it has been done before. So I'm just going to get my, my slides up here. So bear with me. There we go. So um, I'll recap very quickly how, how we actually do this. Um, now this is building on the advice on the UK Committee on Climate Change. So as Elizabeth said, you know, energy efficiency is something we, we can and should be doing now. But because most of our buildings are very old and, and quite poorly designed, um, we'll still need a form of, of low carbon or renewable heat, even if we insulate them to the maximum. So, so that's what this presentation is mostly about. So principally, there are two main solutions to get us away from our current dependence on, on natural or fossil gas. And those are heat networks and heat pumps. So for those of you who don't know, uh, heat networks are basically a kind of central heating system for, for cities. So rather than having a gas boiler in each home, you generate your heat in a large power station. So today those are gas fired. In the future, they can be uh, large heat pumps taking heat from, say, the river. And that heat is then piped to buildings uh, underground. So instead of having a gas pipe coming into your house, you have a hot water pipe. It's been done elsewhere. It's a relatively, well, it's a very mature technology. And it works primarily in, in city centres where you've got lots and lots of buildings, high heat demand. So the, um, you can pay for the very expensive infrastructure. So the CCC say about 20% of um, of our buildings could be converted to heat networks. So that would be city centres primarily. So for the re remaining um, set of buildings, the key solution there is uh, a thing called a heat pump. So hopefully most of you have heard of this, but if you haven't, heat pumps are essentially um, a fridge in reverse. So they extract heat from the air on the ground, they concentrate it and then they put it inside your house in the same way that your fridge extracts the heat from the compartment and if you fill the back of your fridge you'll feel it's warm and that's the heat from inside being circulated out. So heat pumps should be installed um, in areas that don't have access to natural gas, so people who are in rural areas using coal, oil and LPG, switching homes that can to, to heat pumps. They're also the main solution for about 60% of buildings that are in areas mainly suburban areas that aren't really dense enough to have a heat network. So individual homes that need to have a heat system. So obviously that's a huge number of, of buildings I've just said there. And there's a bit of uncertainty at the moment as to how technically feasible it would be to install a heat pump into all those homes. So many of you have probably heard of, of hydrogen bandied around as a potential solution for the future. Now the Committee on Climate Change are very clear that actually what we should be doing now is installing heat pumps in homes that can have them alongside uh, a gas boiler. 
so a kind of hybrid system and, and that would allow us to manage some of the electricity system impacts so rather than having um, 26 million heat pumps across the UK we'd have homes with a, a small heat pump and retaining the gas boiler and that gives us some flexibility in future so if at this stage we don't really know if hydrogen what cost hydrogen will be and how available it will be for, for this sector so this hybrid heat pump route allows us to keep our options open in the future so at the end of, the, of this decade if it looks like electric heat and heat pumps can be rolled out across the building stock then we go fully electric if hydrogen is a cheap fuel that is available to us we retain the gas network and we use that hydrogen just to, to top up um, the system on very cold days avoiding the need to have heat pumps running uh, and all the electricity network impacts that that would create so i've touched on this because i'm sure many of you have heard about the hydrogen debate it's uh, one of the hot topics at the moment in, in climate policy i think it's important to reiterate that committing climate change are very clear that that fuel if available and that's a big if should be prioritized for areas such as heavy industry heavy goods vehicles um, and ferries we shouldn't be basing our solution on uh, putting hydrogen 100 percent hydrogen into the gas network and converting that way so that's an important part of this as you think about the kind of just transition because obviously moving away from gas boilers is a, is a big transition and that has big implications for, for industry as well so what this all looks like um this is essentially the slide that elizabeth showed uh, boxes uh, simply this is glasgow so you've got your heat networks in the city center in the suburbs you've got um, heat pumps potentially with that role for hydrogen and then out in the rural areas um, heat pumps perhaps a role for bioenergy where buildings are particularly difficult to, to heat so this is just to, to bring it alive a little bit so i thought i would touch on kind of just transition aspects first before moving on to, to how we're doing and the, and the policy and i think given that the the low carbon heat technologies that we have are a slightly higher cost to run than the gas boilers so that's an important consideration um, i think we'll have to see the, the price of gas go up if renewables is complete obviously that has big implications for people's heating bills the level of fuel poverty um, it is possible to get those costs down so we can get heat pumps cheaper heat networks are all would already be uh, the equivalent cost to, to a gas boiler uh, but if we have the right scale so we decide to roll technologies out at speed and the plan for growth we can get those those costs down the same goes for, for upfront costs so a connection to a heat network for a household is, is roughly the same cost as a gas boiler today which is great if you're installing a heat pump it's it's a lot more money so you know a gas boiler is three to four thousand pounds a heat pump is somewhere between eight eight to fifteen thousand at the moment so again that those costs those upfront kits costs can be brought down but we need the scale and we need a real in industry plan to, to do that and even with all that going on i think there'll still be a, a higher upfront cost for us to pay and that's what we need to think about in terms of distributing those costs fairly the third point i wanted to make was around the workforce so at the moment most of the, the heating industry install gas boilers it's very possible and in fact it's already possible for them to retrain to to install things like like heat pumps uh, most of the people who do those technologies started out do, doing gas where we'll need to think about things more carefully in the future is the, the gas network so if um, we have a fully electric future that means the gas network no longer has a role so the people who work on that in that industry would need to be transitioned if we have a hybrid future with electricity and gas or hydrogen um, that's a more diverse kind of set of skills and there would still be a role for for them i guess it's not all doom and gloom um yes there are higher costs but those are costs we have to pay to, to tackle our climate emissions there's, there's no getting to net zero if we don't do this but also the, the retrofit of our existing building stock is a huge opportunity to fix leaky homes like give people warmer homes and that's better for health and lots of other reasons so it, it is a huge opportunity to tackle a problem that we've been lumbered with for for decades now we have some of the poorest quality housing stock in, in europe so in terms of action and, and how we're doing the i'd say overall the picture has been as i said 
very slow progress. The Scottish Government have made uh, improvements in the last year. So we've seen increased funding um, for heat schemes, which is really good. But we are starting from a very low base. Uh, there's a heat networks bill to, to go through the Scottish Parliament uh, later this year, which again is really good. But we're lacking kind of a clear plan for how many heat networks we'd actually like to build. So I'd like to see that tackled. And I think given the scale of the, the challenge for people who are on gas at the moment, what we really need is uh, we're calling this a, a sector deal approach. So if you take the example of, of offshore wind, um, that industry agreed with the UK government um, to quadruple the amount of offshore wind farms over a decade. So a huge scaling up of activity. But in exchange for that kind of long term clarity and subsidy support, the industry agreed a cost reduction path. So you've seen the cost of offshore wind fall and measures to increase domestic content. And we'd like to see the same kind of approach taken in in the heat sector. So how do we get up to installing about 70,000 heat pumps a year over the next five years? And that goes alongside all the energy efficiency schemes and programmes that Elizabeth mentioned. Right, that's a lot of information. So I will leave it there and um, hand over to, to Fraser for the next presentation. Thanks, thanks Fabrice. Um, I'll uh, do what I can to share my screen. Good morning, everybody. I'm Fraser, I'm from uh, Energy Action Scotland. Um, my, my focus and emphasis this morning is, is very much on fairness and ensuring that the most vulnerable are prioritised as responses to the climate emergency are being progressed. For me, they shouldn't be overlooked. Their issues are considerable and they need to be part of the fabric of, a, of that transition, that just transition. So for me, fairness at the heart of the decision making and fairness is a pillar of that decision making. My slides seem to have stopped. <laughs> so Energy Action Scotland is charity campaigns. We campaign for the end to fuel poverty in Scotland. And I'll, I'll be honest, we've been campaigning for a very long time and very little has improved. The organisation started in the 80s and we pretty much still have the same very high levels of fuel poverty in Scotland. We've got a membership of over 180 organisations and yet we are part of the existing Homes Alliance and work closely with colleagues in the private sector and the third sector. If I could, could I remind people, put things a bit in context, there are four main drivers for fuel poverty. Yeah, the fabric of the building is important, the cost of energy is important, how much money people have is important and how they live their lives in their homes is also very important. We need to recognise this and the challenges that people face in trying to make a difference and to change the way in which they live their lives. We need to take people with us. We need to create engagement in communities. There's a role for individuals and community organisations to help start those conversations because we still need to persuade people to make changes. I think we all know too well how difficult it is to persuade any individual, an individual in our family to make a difference. It's pretty difficult, never mind changes to the one million households that we would need to make to make any inroads. But the few poor need support to do so. They may want to make a difference, but they have difficult choices every day with limited means. The choice between food and heating their home, which in many cases is leaky, inefficient and detrimental to their health. So is there a challenge? I see a challenge to ensure that there's no competition or conflict between two things that are fundamentally socially and environmentally good. But unless we're careful, the measures and the costs of addressing climate change could end up being passed on to groups in society that can ill afford it. I put this one up, and this isn't a dig at the Committee on Climate Change at all, but if you look at these suggestions that are from one of the reports, this isn't a set of options. 
for the few poor. It doesn't speak to them. Those in extreme poverty don't, for example, in one of the earlier things, they don't fly anywhere. They don't have food to waste. They don't have choices. They tend to be digitally excluded. They're the least likely to go to mainstream sources of support. They live in the poorest housing, areas of multiple deprivation, poorest life chances, the lowest life expectancy. They need a hand up. They need not handouts, but they need a hand up. They need people to come and support them and help them and prioritise them for the changes that need to be made. Elizabeth kind of touched on the kind of scale of the challenge at the beginning. Yeah, 25% in fuel poverty, and it has been that way for some time. And I think we're all expecting that's going to increase at this particular time. Um, given the impact of COVID-19, that number is likely to increase. Rural areas um, face even greater challenges, particularly where there's no gas, where homes rely on electricity or unregulated fuels, as we touched on, oil, LPG. There's less choice. Um, people in those circumstances end up rationing their energy use. They effectively disconnect themselves from their energy supplies due to a lack of income and the choices, the difficult choices they have to make. In 2018, for example, homeowner fuel poverty was already on the increase, with 23% um, of homeowners being fuel poor. So, and the other figure that's there, £560 is the fuel poverty gap. That's the kind of additional income that it would take to lift people out of fuel poverty and allow them to live a comfortable life. And that's an estimate. And it's not so much a reduction figure either. If you could reduce things by £560, that sounds like a, an alternative. But it isn't because people are not making those choices. They're not living those comfortable lives now. They're choosing food over energy. It's not that taking £560 away from their cost will help. They need some help to lift them out of fuel poverty. The 2019 target for Scotland in the Fuel Poverty Act is that no more than 5% will be in fuel poverty by 2040. But let's face it, there really shouldn't be any at all. It's like an unacceptable thing that we have. It's hard to believe that in our society that we even think that 5% is acceptable. I think if anything, this is one of those days that a target should be absolutely exceeded. But there are new technologies and systems available that can help people. But for me, one of the key things there is that they need to be regulated. They need to be regulated to protect consumers and the vulnerable. And I think um, Fabrice touched on it there. There's, there's work on heat networks, but for me, they also need to be regulated. It's fundamentally important that they are regulated to ensure that the vulnerable are protected. That they have choices, they have recourse, should there be difficulties or issues with these new systems that they'll be engaged with. Hey, Elizabeth spoke earlier on kind of buildings and building standards and kind of here's a you know there's a list of things here about targets and dates um, by which um, buildings should be improved. I think the scale of the challenge is huge in getting properties to a good standard and, and for me one of the key things is that we should be aiming for the highest standards that are achievable not you know we've got interim targets of things to move to C but if today we spend our time and effort moving a property from E to C, but fundamentally we should have lifted it straight to B because the long term says that's where we should be. That's the place where we are most likely to have the greatest impact. So some of the interim targets for me are kind of stepping stones, but they're, they're really not seeing the bigger picture. We should be moving them as quickly as we can from their lowest state to the highest state possible. I accept that it's practical, it needs to be practical and in some ways affordable, but at the same time, our ambition should be greater. There are already many people who already live in, for example, C um, graded homes that are already in fuel poverty. And I think the last um, housing survey 
demonstrated just how many that was. So solutions. We see two tests in almost everything that's being proposed. Um, are they likely to have a demonstrable improvement on the lives of the fuel poor? So are measures going to be equally available to all of Scotland's population? Equity is important. Access is important. Prioritising those in most need is important. And does what's being proposed increase or decrease the cost of the amenities provided by the energy that's going to be provided? I think one of the examples I would use is that the fuel poor, yeah, electric vehicle infrastructure, for example, which may be being rolled out by energy companies, ultimately will find its way onto it, all of our energy costs. So that's additional energy costs on the fuel poor, who are already in a very difficult position. Essentially, it's a tax on the fuel poor. We need measures to insulate those people, pardon the pun, but we need measures to insulate the fuel poor from some of the changes that are coming that will require investments that ultimately will be passed on to consumers. But at the same time, they should not become a tax on people who are already in difficult circumstances, facing difficult choices. There are certainly many opportunities for us all to ensure that there is, things are joined up. Um, the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategy um, is one of those kind of key areas for me. So we need to make sure that this and our climate change responses are all joined together and we have opportunity to do so. Fairness at the heart of everything. It would be wrong to bring forward climate change benefiting activities that leave the poor as some sort of acceptable short term collateral damage. They fundamentally should be prioritised and supported. That will take resources, that will take local groups working one to one and face to face with individuals to understand their circumstances and to support them. Fuel poverty kills people every year in Scotland. It's unacceptable. Those vulnerable people deserve to be considered first. For solutions, for me, less complexity, greater scale, greater pace, with the most vulnerable being the priority. And that's me, and I'm happy to hand back over to Caroline. Thanks very much, Elizabeth, for Bruce and Fraser. Um, that's quite a, a stark picture that was laid out. Um, some pretty shocking statistics. If you haven't heard them before, heating in buildings is responsible for um, almost half of Scotland's climate emissions every year. 25% of households in Scotland living in fuel poverty and having to make the choice between heating and eating every day. Um, and some really big figures on the ambition and the, the scale and the speed at which we need to move to tackle these issues. So um, Elizabeth talked about needing to double the size of the fuel poverty programme needing to double the number of heat pumps year on year. As Fabrice was saying, we need to be putting in 70,000 heat pumps uh, every year for the next five years. Um, but some really great gains to be made, aside from, from obviously tackling climate emissions, there's figures of, of 6,000 jobs in, in retrofit, or 9,000 at the peak of activity, and of course tackling um, that, that huge problem of fuel poverty and, and making everyone's homes warmer, more comfortable um, and cutting our climate emissions. Um, but uh, a lot of work to be done and a lot um, of ambition needed from the government uh, and from Parliament to push these things through. So there have been a few questions.